Hey folks, Riley Holland here. I'm here today with Robert Grossman, the wellness business systematologist. How you doing, Robert? I'm doing great, Riley. How are you? I'm great too. Good to have you here. So it seems like very often the people who are the best at what they do get that way by making lots of mistakes. And similarly, when we're learning something new, we can often get the best sense of the topic by looking at some of the most common mistakes that people make. Robert, what do you think of that? Would you agree that the soul of the topic can kind of be found by learning from general mistakes that people make? Oh, that's a very interesting idea that the soul of the topic is in the mistakes. I Actually, that is very interesting for me because when I was in the world of big business as a consultant for 20 years, working with literally hundreds of different businesses and exploring all the different aspects of their operations, I was amazed at the errors that they make. I mean, it actually became almost an obsessive interest with me because I was looking at these giant organizations with all this resources, power, energy at their disposal. And yet they were misusing it almost to the point of abuse. They were wasting their energy, wasting their money, doing damage to their own interests, doing damage to the environment, simply making errors. And I became obsessed almost with this question, why do they misuse their resources to this level. So I began to explore this first from the perspective of a management consultant and then later from the perspective of an insider when I actually held executive positions inside of a few large organizations. Let me ask you this because you mentioned that and I think a lot of people kind of have the sense that these large corporations are making choices that are not in the interest of the planet, not in the interest of the people around them, the communities. But it sounds like you're saying, too, that they're not even making choices that are in their own interest. Is that right? Well, that's what intrigued me the most, because that's exactly true. The Many of the choices that they make are simply suboptimal business choices, and you would think they could do better, but they don't. Uh, they're not stupid. They don't do anything by accident. So what's the reason for it? And this line of inquiry is actually what led me to the whole process of questioning the foundations of the way we do business in our culture. You know, that's the heart of my philosophy of business today. It's the it's based on the insights that came out of looking at those mistakes. Interesting. Okay. So maybe taking a look at just business overall in that world, what were some of the specific common mistakes, just kind of broad strokes that you saw maybe in the corporate big government world before we take a look at specifically wellness businesses? Well, many of the mistakes are the same, just committed on different scales. So let me just mention, just for example, one of the biggest mistakes that I see all the time in giant business, but also in small entrepreneurial wellness business is simply not testing. I mean, it is amazing how few businesses ever take the trouble to test any aspect of their operations or their strategy or their business model and actually test that empirically against other approaches. And you know, as a business owner, if you fail to test different approaches, you're simply betting your destiny on arbitrary subjective decisions. You're trusting to conjecture. It makes me sad to see this because it's a huge lost opportunity. We don't have the power or the right to predetermine what the marketplace wants. We don't have the power to predetermine the best price, to guess what the best package would be, to assume what the best approach would be to doing whatever it is we do. But we do have the power, and in fact, I believe we have the obligation to put every important question to vote by the only people whose vote actually matters which is our own clients and our prospects. Interesting. So can you give me an example of testing in the context of a wellness business? Like what's something that someone could do to start testing one of their processes? A business is made up of multiple systems and factors that interplay together to create the entire dynamic of the business. And what's interesting about it is you can identify these, you can reorganize them, you can reconstruct each of the specific systems or factors that goes into the business. And as you do that, 
the interaction of all the different aspects of the business are going to change. Just like the way that, you know, an outstanding body worker can readjust something in your lower back and suddenly your shoulder pain disappears. That's the kind of transformative impact that testing can have on a business. So a wellness business can test the most obvious is different price points. Testing price points is incredibly powerful, but it's not just price. You can test different approaches to bringing in new clients, different approaches to sales. For businesses that do active advertising, you can test different ad concepts, different headlines. 80% of your message when you're communicating with the market is actually in your headline. That's like the advertisement for your advertisement. So testing different headlines on advertisements can be incredibly powerful. And you definitely want to test your follow-up approach because in a wellness business, 80 to 90% of the value of a client relationship is in the long-term follow-up because in the healing process, it's long-term. You can give somebody a great massage or a facial or a treatment or a session of nutritional counseling or whatever it is you do, but in order to really realize the benefits in her life, that client is going to need to make some choices and go through a process over time. So the way that you follow up with that person is going to determine most of the value of your relationship with your client and also, by extension, most of the revenue and profit that the business realizes. So testing different ways to follow up and support clients through their longer-term process is uh, incredibly important for wellness businesses in particular. Well, I feel like... I might already kind of know the answer to this question, but let me ask you anyway, why do you think that people are resistant to this? Because I immediately when we start talking about testing and thinking about my own business, I do feel a sense of resistance. Like it seems like it would be a ton more work. It seems like it would be a different kind of work and all my, you know, my baby, my headline that I wrote might not make it. Um, what do you think it makes people not take advantage of this most useful and, and crucial uh, technique. Well, you know, you're right. It, it does seem like it would be a lot more work. I hear that from a lot of people. Uh, and so let me address that first, because I think that's very interesting. The truth is, it does not require more work. I mean, this kind of comes down to a part of my philosophy of business, that we all are putting in, we all have the same resources available to us in terms of the time and the energy of our life. As a business owner, you have a certain amount of energy, a certain amount of intellectual capital, a certain amount of time that you are going to invest in your business. So the choice that you have, I mean, for most business owners, it's not basically how much time and energy are we going to put into our business. We already put it all in. The question is how much results and benefits are you going to get back from that in return? And this is where it's essential to test because no matter what results you're getting, you have to put in the same amount. It costs the same amount to advertise, for example, no matter how effective that ad is in bringing in responses to the whole process that goes into communicating with a marketplace and getting a person to the point where they pick up the phone and dial the number of your business requires a certain amount of effort and energy. And it's going to be the same amount no matter how effective the person who answers the phone is at actually converting that phone call into an appointment for a visit. So this is an illusion that it's harder. The truth is it's just the opposite. Testing is the key to unlock an exponential improvement in the easefulness of the business and the results that are produced from the same investment. But it, it, I love it, that idea because it's, it's hard to get at first, but the idea that we all have this exact same amount of time. I remember a, f a friend of my family was a massage therapist and he was hired by Nike and they flew him out to work with athletes who were in competition sponsored by Nike and he was getting paid quite a bit. Now, was he that much better than any other massage therapist? I don't know. He can't have been that much better, but he was doing a lot better for it. Now, that's kind of a special case but it seems like anybody could turn that dial up even with the same amount of hours that they have in the day. That's right. We can all turn that dial up. 
I've talked over the years with hundreds of business owners, and the story is always the same. At first, I hear from every business owner, oh, there's, actually, you can't find a great opportunity for improvement in my business. We don't have too many degrees of freedom, or our business is different. These ideas won't work. But the truth is, every business has vast opportunities for improvement. Actually, every area of personal endeavor that we're involved in, we have unlimited opportunity for improvement. This is just as true for the business as anything else. But what's really interesting in business is that most businesses are so locked in to the same old way of doing things, the traditional way, the way that's a standard in their industry, or the way that they always have done it. They're so locked into that, they have no idea that there are multiple opportunities to not just create incremental performance improvement, but to have transformational impact on the business by testing out and experimenting with alternative ways to do it. But it is very uncomfortable, and I simply think the reason for that has to do with habit, that we are, we are in the habit of doing things a certain way. We learned a certain way to connect with people. We have our own ideology and belief system about what works, what doesn't, what's ethical, what isn't. And uh, we just come to accept that and take it for granted. But, uh, you know, the truth is breakthrough ideas always come from outside the box. That's why they lead to breakthroughs. So if you're in a wellness business and want to find breakthrough ideas to test in, say, your sales process, for example, the best place to look is outside of the wellness business or at other wellness businesses that are outside of your area or outside of your region or outside of your country. You've got to look outside. And, and that is what I think can be very uncomfortable for people at first. But once you get used to it and once you make it a habit and once you learn the process of identifying First of all, identifying the levers within your business that can lead to performance improvement or lead to substantial transformation of the way that you serve your clients, to put it in that language. That's the first thing you need to do. Then, learning to look outside, outside of your immediate business, outside of your region, outside of your industry even, to find alternative methods. And then to actually develop a a methodology of testing, collecting and measuring the results, tracking the, the results, tabulating and analyzing that, and choosing the best performing alternative, that's when you move into the region of exponential growth, and it's a great feeling. So that sense of discomfort, it, it becomes exhilaration over time as this becomes a practice and a skill. Well, I think that's a huge important point, this idea that a breakthrough comes from outside the box. I think everybody should write that down and put it on their, on their wall above their desk because it's so important but so easy to forget. That by definition, if something new is going to happen, if something is going to be a breakthrough for your growth in your business or anywhere else, it's going to be something that's new. And the way we're built, unfortunately, or not unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, is that we're resistant to change or people will always be resistant to change and to seeing things differently at first. But the point that you make that if, if you get used to it, if you get used to the idea then gradually you can become great at seeing things outside of the box and being able to stomach that initial feeling of, oh, well, before I improve, I have to look at the mistakes I'm making. That's the step one, which I guess is kind of what we're doing today. So what is another mistake that you see happening in the wellness business that people can learn from. I'll tell you another mistake, which I see everywhere. One of the worst mistakes a business can make is running institutional advertising instead of direct response advertising. Let me explain what I mean here because I used a couple of terms there that maybe not everybody is familiar with. So first of all, what is institutional advertising? Well, almost every ad that we see in print, in magazines or newspapers, or that we receive in, in mailing or hear on the radio or see on TV, almost all of those ads are based on institutional type advertising. This practice is, is dominant. This type of advertising achieves no productive purpose whatsoever. It is ineffective. It is vacuous. It is completely wasteful. 
it tells you one thing. It tells you how great the company that's paying for the advertising is, how old they are, how stable they are, how proud they are of what they do. But it offers no compelling reason at all to choose their product or service. Institutional advertising fails to make an intelligent case on why an intelligent client should favor this company versus their competition. It fails to direct the viewer or the reader of the ad to any sort of intelligent action. It seems like that's the kind of advertising we, we look at when the average person says, "What? I don't even know what this ad is for. With the where advertising starts to look really silly. That's right. That's why the very concept of Super Bowl advertising has become a massive joke in our culture. We see this and we don't know what it's for. And seriously, this is another thing that makes me sad because there's incredible amount of resource invested in institutional advertising every day. Huge amounts of money, amazing creative talent, and all these resources could be used to create so much value and serve so many people. But instead, it's wasted on foolishness instead of being productive. Well, I love it because I think that it might be common for, for someone to think of advertising is institutional advertising. A lot of people think of those, they're just the same thing and might not even know about this other category of direct advertising that for small business owners makes a lot more sense in terms of actual practical value. So tell me a little bit about what is what is direct advertising. Direct response advertising, it, actually the name basically describes what it is. It's advertising which is designed to evoke an immediate response. That means some sort of action will be taken, a visit, a telephone call, even a purchasing decision. There's a measurable action which the prospect will take as a result of experiencing the advertising and res responding to it favorably. Direct response advertising tells a complete story. So this is a type of advertising that actually presents factual, specific reasons why your business, your product, your service is superior to any of the alternatives that are out there on the market. It is often analytical. It is fact-based. It's advertising that makes a complete and logical case for why a certain person should take a certain course of action in order to better their life in some way. It's, it overcomes the sales objections. There are predictable objections that anybody has, even to the most innocent sounding decision, like getting a massage. My mom always has a hundred reasons why she doesn't have time to do it today. This direct response advertising overcomes those objections because it understands what they are. It responds to all the major questions that people have. And maybe most importantly, this and this is something institutional advertising would never dare to do in a million years, direct response advertisements make specific promises about what you can expect in terms of performance or results. And it backs up those promises with risk reversal. So it takes the risk away from the client or the prospect, the business owner accepts the risk and therefore makes a promise which has credibility and weight. And finally, direct response advertising actually directs people to take an action, which is the defining characteristic. Direct response advertising can produce an unending stream of prospects, and they're very good prospects because they're pre-qualified. They're people who resonated with the message in the ad. They've understood the arguments that are in your copy. They're pre-sold on whatever you're offering. They're favorably inclined already. They like you and they like your offer and they understand it. So from a business point of view, from an economic point of view, it's a very beneficial way to go. Also from a perspective of ethical business, it's extremely beneficial because this is the least manipulative form of advertising that you can possibly use. You're actually speaking to your prospect as a human being empathizing with their situation, understanding their problem, and advising them on who is the person who can benefit from what you offer and who is not. But if you are that type of person, this advertising is explaining to them why their life will be better if they take advantage of a service which can genuinely deliver value to them. So when you use direct response advertising instead of institutional advertising, you are enriching the lives of your prospects, whereas institutional advertising will rather use fancy images and catchy musical beats to try to manipulate people psychologically and trigger some sort of associations when they see a brand logo on a shelf. Well, let's talk about that for a second, because everything that you said about direct response advertising makes perfect sense 
to my rational mind. I see exactly how that is ethical, how it's effective, and how it's going to bring people in. But part of me says, well, that's not all that sexy compared to a 30-minute TV commercial with bikinis and beer and pop music and everything. Do you think that there's something missing from direct response marketing that institutional advertising has in terms of this immediately get your attention, short attention span. I mean, are people going to read a whole direct response marketing pitch? It's true. The way I described direct response advertising, it does sound quite dry and possibly analytical. I can see why you would get that impression. But actually, the truth is, that people buy based on emotional reasons. We always buy based on emotion. And we make up the reasons for it later. We've got to have a rationale. But it's really the emotion that gets us. I mean, when people are looking for a benefit, somebody, for example, who's in pain and looking for relief from the pain, that concept of getting relief from pain has a tremendous emotional charge. That idea is going to make the person happy. And that happiness is what directs the person to actually take action, to do something, to get rid of the pain. So good direct response advertising for sure is something that's that's very compassionate. It relies on empathy. It understands the emotions and the language that's used is connected with emotional patterns. That makes sense. And I think that w when you said that, I think I was noticing the missing piece for me, which is that you're talking about somebody who is already in pain. It seems like the direct response marketing is itself very directed. It's talking to a specific group of people, whereas the institutional advertising is some sometimes just, hey, over here, look at me, to try to get anyone to turn their head. That's exactly right, because when we do direct response advertising, we are measuring the results. As I said before, we're putting the same amount of investment into our advertising campaign, no matter what results we get. So if we can increase the response from one half percent up to, say, four percent, we're now getting eight times more return on the same investment. That is transformational. We're always looking for the most effective connection with our audience. And the way to do that is to speak with very specific people. So yeah, some people are in pain. Other people have other types of pain, other types of lack or want or need in their life, which we can address with whatever it is our business does. Other people are not in pain at all, but they are mesmerized by the possibility of development, expansion, growth. And that's another way to go. These are all separate groups of people with separate reasons for taking any sort of wellness-related action. And we have to recognize that our market is not an amorphous blob. It's not a generic Mr. Average Joe Smith. It's made up of multiple very specific groups. So it's very important to understand exactly who our customers are. So it sounds like even if somebody owns a uh a massage center, they might have completely different sets of direct marketing copy for different types of clients they might be looking for. Is that right? For sure, they'd have different types of clients. Any massage center has 10 or 15 or 20 different general categories of people who come or categories of needs that they can meet with all the different services that they offer. And it absolutely does make sense over time for them to develop separate messages and separate ways of speaking to each of those groups of people. Part of loving your client is to understand who they are and what they need, and not everyone is the same. It absolutely makes sense to do that. But it's not necessary to do it. The truth is that even simple direct response advertising that reduces the message to its lowest common denominator, it will always be a huge step ahead compared to institutional advertising. Because at least you can measure the response that you're receiving, and at least it allows you to begin testing different approaches. Direct response advertising is intimately related with testing because the fact that you can measure and track the results that your message is getting unlocks the door that allows you to test. And this is what lets you step onto a path of continuous improvement in what you're doing. I mean, a direct response advertising campaign evolves over time. So this is a natural progression for most businesses most of the time when I begin to work with a wellness business, most of them are not 
doing any form of direct response advertising. And we go on a journey, and it's a progression from simplicity to increasing sophistication. And of course, the results improve with increasing sophistication, but the big wins, the big improvements are at the beginning with implementing the basics in a, a simple and easy way. So I don't want anybody to get intimidated by the idea that it's so complex. That complexity is something that is built up over time. It's built up over months and years based on the actual results and based on increasingly understanding exactly what results different forms of communication with the market are getting. So it develops organically, actually, out of the desire to further and further discover drivers of performance improvement in the advertising. So do you have an example from the wellness business world or anywhere else of direct advertising and testing making a huge improvement on sales or on the quality of a business? Absolutely. I mean, I'll just give you, I'll just give you a, an example. Probably everybody in the wellness world has seen over the last five, 10 years, we have seen an explosion of franchise businesses offering uh, massage and salons. Massage Envy has exploded everywhere, which is something that a lot of my clients who are in the massage business find frustrating because it's difficult to compete with them. And the whole basis of that business is that they have set things up in a way that they can measure and track the results of their advertising. They've evolved their message over time until now. If you go to Massage Envy and get a massage, they'll collect your name, your address, your phone number, your email address, and you'll start getting special offers for a special gift package with a discount on Mother's Day, special offers for special package on your birthday. They have developed those over time and they've tracked it and they've measured everything. And that's what makes them a formidable competitor. Interesting. Now, do you think that from the point of view of a, of a smaller business, you mentioned that a lot of people might get frustrated by that. And I can see why if, if someone's doing well with these techniques. Do you think it's important to, let's say, study your competition if you're a local business to see who else is out there, see what they're up to, see how they're doing their advertising and incorporate that into how you're doing your own thing? Well, sure, it's vital to do it. But a lot of people have the wrong idea about studying the competition. A lot of people try to study the competition in order to learn their methods and implement them. But actually, the reason you want to study your competition is to find new alternative ways of doing things that you can put into your testing system. It's testing. And this is the key why I, I mentioned I talk with a lot of business owners who are frustrated with massage envy, but they move to a feeling of delight over time because the truth is uh, an independent business can always outperform a franchise like massage envy. The advantage that massage envy has, and this doesn't only go for them, it basically any franchise or any, any sort of replicatable business system has this concept at its core. What they're doing is they're analyzing all of the data from the entire market, and they have a tremendous amount of data, which does allow them to do a very powerful job of testing and fine-tuning their message and developing quite complex marketing and business systems. But they're looking at a national business, and if you are a local business owner, you have a distinctive business which is completely unique in the way that you serve your clients. When you start to do this on your own, you're going to develop your own approaches which are completely unique to your business and therefore even more effective than anything that you could come up with on a national level. You're more intimate at that level. And when you combine the intimacy of a local business with the power of testing and of communicating with methods of direct response, you have a very powerful combination because that intimacy creates an enormous opportunity for a deep, deep connection with your clients. And deep connection translates into tremendously valuable relationship. It's valuable for the client because it allows you as a wellness business to deliver incredible support, not only in the form of one-off service, but over time and along the process as it evolves in a person's life, 
you can deliver incredible support through the healing process, but also from a business perspective, as the client receives value from you, you also receive value from the client. That's how it works. So that value that the client experiences shows up in the business as revenue and as profit. So let's say you've got your wellness business and you've implemented testing, tracking, you're doing direct marketing, and you're beginning to focus on what makes you unique in the positive sense as a, as a smaller business. And these things are kind of humming, but things still aren't quite working. What's another mistake that someone might be making, even if they've got all of these other things coming along? A lot of times I talk with a business owner and they they tell me, oh yeah, I've tried this. I've, I tried to test. I've tried different advertising approaches. It's just not working for us. A lot of times the core issue is another huge mistake, which is failing to understand and articulate your own uniqueness. And, and this actually, this idea of your uniqueness and building your business by expressing your own uniqueness is so core to my philosophy of business that I, I could do a multi-day workshop on it with you. And I often do actually multi-day workshops on this. So I think in this interview, we can only cover this. We can only just touch on it extremely briefly. But, but that said, let me make a few comments about it because the, what I call your uniqueness, there's a business term for this, which is called the unique selling proposition or the USP. If you fail to develop the USP for your business, and if you fail to use it in all the business communication you ever do, this is one of the most common mistakes. It's almost as common as institutional advertising. But your USP is the advantage that sets you apart from everyone else. It's what makes you unique. It is the essence of your mission to serve your clients. It is like the philosophical foundation of your business. And the essence of that uniqueness should pervade everything that you do. You don't want to have a spineless business that's not able to articulate what is the unique gift that you're trying to give. And when uh, I've seen so many business owners, when they start to work on this earnestly, they are able very quickly to transform themselves from a commodity type of business into something that's so unique that they can honestly say, I now have no competition. Uh, they're out of the competition mindset because they understand that what they're offering is unique service that can't be replicated by anyone else. There actually is no such thing as true competition. Well, it seems like that would be the moment where it clicks in terms of the feeling of passionate identification with your business. Do you find that to be true where not only does it help them get outside of competition, but then they start to feel like, oh yeah, this is really my thing. Well, absolutely. Because it's incredibly freeing. I mean, like we said earlier that we are, as a culture, we're locked into a set of concepts an ideology, a philosophy of how business is done. And the, the truth is that is a defective ideology, and the, by, we're locked into it, though, at the cultural level. It's below our consciousness like water to a fish because we grew up with that. It's part of our entire worldview. So as you develop your USP, it's like giving yourself permission to step out of the pack. And, you know, by definition, doing the opposite of what the herd is doing is always going to get you better results. I mean, think about every business owner in the world is trying to get attention for her business, her products and services, what she can offer. And, you know, if you have a crowd of people and there's one guy in the middle waving a red flag, you're going to look at that one guy. But if everybody in a crowd of 10,000 people is waving a red flag, that's just the way to become invisible. And that's a lot of times that's kind of what we do in our, in our business culture. So when you really lock onto your USP, it gives you permission to do things in a different way. It, uh, it allows you to bring your personal authenticity into your business. It makes it much richer and much deeper. I think that's a very empowering message and hopefully something that can lay to rest permanently what I think is one of those very common under-the-surface cultural ideas, which is that if I go into business... I have to sacrifice my some part of my individuality. Like I'm going into someone else's territory. I have to do it 
their way or the market's way. And I think to a degree, of course, you have to know, like you're saying, you have to know your market. You have to know what's going on around you. But the idea that to actually maximize your business potential is to maximize your uniqueness and your individuality, I think that's that might be a surprise to a lot of people, but that's extremely empowering and probably a huge relief to a lot of people who are listening. Well, I agree. It was an enormous surprise to me when I first began to realize that. And it, it dawned on me over years. And as I began to understand that, and as I, as I began to embrace my own uniqueness in my approach to business, what I felt was liberation. Everything becomes more easeful. You know, oh, I can finally take off the mask. Thank God. And you feel that people are valuing you for what you actually are. I mean, wellness business is about helping people along in a process of healing or increasing their level of vitality, energy, and well-being. And the best way to do this is to form an authentic human connection with a person and deliver to them whatever it is that is your personal unique gift. And that is what the USP is about at the business level. A lot of people actually get very confused when I talk to them about it. They, they just don't understand how they can even get started thinking about the uniqueness of their, their business. And, you know, the whole idea is about uniqueness, so every USP is unique. There's no generic answer to that, but it, it genuinely depends on what market niche you've carved out for yourself or what you want to carve out. It depends on what capabilities you have, and it depends on what needs your clients have. But there are a few general patterns that these things tend to follow. So it could be, for example, the highest level of quality. A lot of USPs are based around price, lowest markup. It can be about add-ons that you provide with your basic service, like more information, more education, higher level of service. If you're dealing with actual physical products, it could be something about all products always being in inventory. There's no wait. There's no out of stock. There are no back orders. If you're delivering a personal service, it can be about the appointment scheduling. It's so easy to set an appointment. You don't need an appointment. Appointments are always available on short notice. It can be the availability of 24 by 7 service or personal coaching. There are all sorts of different things that you can do. And, and often, for most wellness business owners, when they start thinking about the USP, it's in a way liberating because you realize that you may not have all these elements built into your business, maybe because your competitors don't have it built in. Maybe it never occurred to you or you never thought that your customers expected it. But when you really start in the process of thinking about your own uniqueness and how you can express that through your business, you may begin to innovate your actual service and innovate your business model and innovate your operations and innovate the way you talk to your clients, innovate the way that you answer the phone, the way that your, your premises are laid out. There are so many different areas. It's just like expressing yourself as a human being where I think as we go through our life cycle as a human being, we, we go through a, a process where we're, we're first kind of, we all want to fit into the culture. For me, high school was the peak of that. I just wanted friends and the way you get friends and popular is by liking the same sports as everybody else and liking the same music that the popular kids like. You learn to fit in. But then hopefully at some point in our life, we begin to actually discover that there's a lot more to us than just copying the musical tastes of the most popular people around us. We discover our own uniqueness and we find that there are infinite ways to express that through every facet of our personality and every facet of the way we lead our life. So the USP in a business is just an extension of that. And it's an amazing lever of exponential growth for businesses because the more ways that you discover in your business to express that USP, and they are infinite, literally, the more, but the more specific, concrete leverage points you discover in your business where you can implement and build in a USP and then communicate that through everything you do, then each of those can deliver massive improvements, massive improvements in the level of service, the level of care that you're able to deliver to your clients because you're just forming a more authentic connection 
from your client's point of view, that's increased effectiveness. But from your business point of view, that's increased revenues, increased numbers of clients you serve, increased profitability, and increased income. So this is really a huge lever to exponential growth, and it's, it's impossible to exhaust it. You can always take another look at this. So I really urge, if you're a wellness business owner, I really urge you to just ask yourself the question, can I articulate my unique selling proposition clearly, crisply, persuasively? Most business owners that I speak to are not able to do that. And if you're not able to do that, you need to work on this right away. Well, it seems like each of these topics, the testing, the direct marketing, the unique selling proposition are very, very deep topics that could kind of go on and on and on. And I regret that we don't have more time to to get even deeper with each of them, but maybe we can talk about them in more detail another time. Hopefully, at least the listener has gotten a couple of things that these are processes, as you've said. This isn't something that you just get once, but something that you evolve your business with. And that for me, because when I first started learning about these things, my head was swimming. But that's why it's been so valuable, Robert, to work with you as my business coach, so that I get to see not just the general principles, but how they apply specifically to what I'm doing and, and watch them evolve. And also simply the idea that these things are out there. These methods are out there. These techniques and new ways of looking things are out there that can improve anybody's business, even if they feel like they're up against a brick wall. So Robert, I really appreciate your time. Always enlightening and always fun to talk with you. We'll do it again soon. Thank you very much, Riley. I'm looking forward to that. And I really hope it was useful. If you're a wellness business owner or manager, a free 30-minute tune-up call with Robert could be a great experience for you. Your business can be more fun, more effective, and more profitable. Just go to wellnessbusinesstuneup.com to get started now. Or call us at 800-430-1567.